So I need to ask a question. Uh, how many of you have got your lights up, like uh, on your house or on the trees around your house? Can you just see your hands? It's your, it looks like Avon Lake has more than Vermillion. Uh, I don't have my lights up yet, and I'm starting to feel kind of slimy about it because I'm like the pastor in our neighborhood, and everybody else has got their lights up all Christmassy, and here's the pastor. His lights are, you know, off. It's dark. Christmas tree is up, but there's no lights on the tree, and I'm just feeling kind of un and kind of slimy, so I just wanted to let you know that. Try to get the lights up. If you're in my neighborhood, I'll try to get the lights up this week. Be a good Christian. So you're like, well, what does that have to do with being a good Christian? Why do we put lights on our trees? Anybody know? To celebrate Jesus. Oh, that's right. Christmas is about Jesus. Jesus as the light of the world. That's where the whole light thing came from. I know Walmart sells a lot of lights, but they didn't come up with the whole light of thing. We started putting lights on our trees, on our houses, on bushes, you know, centuries and centuries and centuries ago to celebrate Jesus as the light of the world. And Christmas is that time when we celebrate him coming. You ready to take some notes? Already, bam. Christmas is the story. Here's what Christmas is all about. Christmas is the story of God's light and love penetrating the darkness of our world, of our darkness. And um, it, it comes, this whole idea comes from John chapter 8, which we've been in last week and be for the rest of the Christmas series, where Jesus stands up and says to the people, he's in the temple, and he says, I am the light of the world. And if you were here last week, we said that he said this when there was all these massive pillars of light, these massive candelabras in the temple, shining light for, the fe- for this holiday festival. And in the midst of that, Jesus says, I am the light of the world, not just of the temple, not just of Jerusalem, not just of Israel. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, that's a key phrase. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's a powerful phrase. We'll never walk in darkness. See, we, we like to celebrate the I am the light of the world, but we forget about this whoever follows, and we end up walking in darkness, and we're like, how, how, how did this happen? I thought Jesus was the light of the world. I've invited Christ in my life. I'm a Christian. I go to church. How come there's darkness in my life? And remember last week we talked about what the darkness was, we said, I don't want to preach the whole sermon, but we said that, that darkness is when we are feeling despair and fear, when it begins to, to rise up in our heart and darkness envelops us, and that fear and that despair begins to take over our lives, and we end up making really bad decisions. The darkness is real. Darkness is when we feel helpless and trapped. Darkness is when I feel confused and lost. But, but Jesus is the light of the world, and he is the light in our darkness. And we said last week, that brings hope. This week, we want to talk about the light, the light of the world. Jesus brings not just hope, but he brings love. And so Christmas is a story of God's light and love penetrating our darkness. We like to talk about this as, as penetrating the darkness of a world that doesn't know Christ But we got to remember back at John 8, 12, that it's Jesus says, whoever follows me. When I stop following Jesus, I end up walking in darkness. When I stop following Jesus, I end up walking in darkness. we we got to understand that it's not a magical thing. The light of the world has come and now everything is just hunky-dory. No, darkness is real. Didn't think I'd get an amen there. Darkness is real. And it doesn't just go away because we read a nice little Bible verse. It doesn't just go away because we cry some tears and say something. Darkness is real today. All you gotta do is watch the news. All you gotta do is look through your news feed in the morning, right? There is just picture after picture, phrase after phrase, story after story of darkness being real. And we gotta talk about that darkness. Otherwise, the light and love, it's just just a story. It's just an abstract thought. It's not until we grasp the power of darkness and begin to kind of define that, that's when we begin to see light. Light shines the brightest and is the clearest in darkness. So 
So what's the darkness that the Bible talks about? What's the darkness that we talk about at Christmas time, at, at Advent? Advent means coming, the coming of the light of the world to bring hope and love. What is this light doing in the darkness? Well, again, last week I tried to talk a little bit about that. I want to talk about it some more today in a, in a new kind of way because the word darkness has got a lot of different meanings. And the way I wanted to talk about darkness today is to go all the way back to the beginning. I mean the beginning. I mean creation. So I want to go all the way back to there. When God created humanity, he made us in love and he made us to run on love. I bet you've never heard that phrase before. We were made, we were created by a loving God to be loved to run on love, to be filled with love, to give love. All of our relationships are places where love is supposed to flow. And so God creates people to be in a love relationship with him. So we love God and we love people. And this is the way God intended life to be. This is the way relationships are supposed to work. You're supposed to love your wife. You're supposed to love your husband. You're supposed to love the people in your relationship with. This is what God intended. He created us in love. For love, to be loved, to give love. It's all about love. But we haven't loved well. And we haven't been loved well. Again, let's go back to the beginning. Not, not long after God created um, Adam and Eve, you begin to see love being spoiled. Love between Adam and God, between Eve and God, and then enmity between sons and brothers. And you begin to see that bad decisions, unloving decisions, when we fail to love each other well, it introduces a darkness. It produces a darkness. It, it intensifies a darkness. It matters how we love each other, and when we don't love well, darkness sneaks into our relationships. This is the story of humanity. God made us to love, to be run, to run on love, but we, we don't love well. And so here we are, all of us sitting here, or if you're listening on the internet, we have all been poorly loved, and we've all loved poorly. We've all been loved in ways that hurt us, that damaged us, and, and there's no way we haven't developed an ability yet to begin to, to see the extent in a human heart of when we have been loved poorly in a way that hurts us, that wounds us, that damages us. And I'm not talking psychology now. I'm talking about relationships. I'm talking about just the way, we, the way things work. When we, when we don't love well, when we say what we shouldn't say to the people we love, when we do things to the, those that we love that we should never do, when we fail to say what we should say, when we fail to do what we should do, all these different ways of failing in love, they hurt, they damage us, they wound us. And since we can't see many times the effect of our words that cut, that wound, the effect of our, of our damaging ways of loving each other, of hurting each other, we don't think that it really makes that big of a difference. But every person you ever met is a wounded person who has been hurt and who has hurt others. This is who we are. We were made, created to be people of love but we end up hurting each other and being hurt. And, and every time we sin, every time we hurt somebody, every time we get hurt, an alienation begins to happen. And we get alienated from God who is love. And this alienation that we feel is darkness. And it, it comes out in our lives in us feeling alienated, feeling unloved, feeling insecure. We may not always put words to that. But the insecurity, the feelings of being unloved is the definition of that alienation. That's that darkness because it matters how we treat each other. And um, the, the word you can use for this is the word sin. It damages each one of us. It produces a darkness. And that darkness, that alienation is the feeling of feeling unloved and insecure. Look at the, notice this word feeling. You're not unloved. Because God is love and loves you with an everlasting love. But come on, we don't always feel that love, right? Especially after you've been hurt, after you've been cut, after you've been betrayed. See, I, I, uh, I have been given four kids to love. 
God entrusted them to me. The truth of the matter is I've failed to love my kids well, and I've hurt them. And, it, and when I see that I hurt them, it breaks my heart. The truth of the matter is I don't always see how I hurt my kids. And I don't want to hurt them. I'm not trying to. I'm, I'm not a bad parent, but I am a sinful parent. And I sin, and I wound my kids. And there's things I've said and done to my kids that I don't even realize how bad I've hurt them. And I've said and done things to my wife. I don't want to hurt my wife, but, 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 I, but I do. She doesn't want to hurt me, but she does. Good, good parents don't want to hurt their kids, but they do. Good husbands don't want to hurt their wives, but they do. Good wives don't want to hurt their husbands, but we do. This is what it means to be people who have been infected by sin. And it seems not a popular thing to talk about today, but friends, it's all around us. Let's just open our eyes and recognize it. Sin happens. It's everywhere. And it damages us. And from a very young age, it creates, before we can define it, it creates a sense of alienation. It creates a sense of insecurity. It creates a sense of I am unloved. And so the human journey is to try to plug that that wound, try to heal that wound. To, to, um, you might say that, that when we are hurt, when we are wounded, when we are damaged, it creates a hole in our heart. It, it cuts us at the deepest places that we are, and we begin to leak. <laughs> we begin to, to, to um, hemorrhage, and this hole in our heart is real. It's a love deficit, because we were made to run on love, it's a very real deficit, and so we don't have the words, but we go to try to fill that love. This is what, we, this is what all humans are doing. We're trying to fill that hole with stuff, with different relationships, with making money, with buying things. We're just, we're, I don't know what we're trying to do in, um, consciously, but subconsciously, we're like, I gotta do something about this gnawing, emptiness that just won't go away, this darkness, this alienation. I, I don't feel like I'm happy. I don't feel like I'm peaceful. I, something's not right. Instead of thinking about it, instead of talking to God about it, we just try to stuff ourselves with more stuff, more money, more experiences, more relationships, more things to try to, try to fill that void. And unfortunately, the darkness is intensified. The darkness is intensified as we try to fill that hole in our hearts, that love deficit with all these self-centered ways. We know that love's important. So some of us turn love into a, a God. We, we know we need to be loved. We, we, we know that, that love fills us, that helps us, and so if love feels good, and so we make love the pursuit of our life, and we begin to, to pursue this love deficit in self-centered ways, but we don't realize that they're self-centered. We're just trying, they're just the ways that we're trying to fill that void, but the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way filling that heart. There's a way of, of, you know, trying to satisfy my life. There's a way that seems right. I mean, I need to be loved. I need love. I need more. I need to fill. It seems right. But in the end, that way is a way that leads to this death, this darkness. Again, this is, this is humanity. This is what all of us do. This is the story of what a what it means to be a person who lives in a sinful world. Sin infects us. Sin darkens our mind. It darkens our understanding. It darkens our judgment. We make bad decisions when darkness rules in our heart. What we need is God's love to fill us. What we need is, is God's love to heal us. What we need is God's love to save us. And I've just given you the history of humanity right there. Four little subpoints under point one. We were made, let me just review real quick. We were created for love, but sin produced a darkness. We said we had to act out of that darkness, try to fill that love deficit, but it's all in vain. It's not working. It, it, it won't satisfy. There's a God shaped hole, a God shaped void in every human being that can only be shaped, be filled by God. But even though I, I hate quoting country music, we. 
we're looking for love in all the wrong places. That's as close as I'm ever going to get to quoting a country song. I can't even believe I'm about to say this. It's true. That's country music. That's, that's, a, that's a true line. We look for love in all the wrong places. And Christmas reminds us, or should, that God who is light and God who is love I love that, that John, the guy that wrote the Gospel of John, is the same guy that wrote the letters at the end of the Bible, John 1, 2, and 3, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. He wrote these powerful, profound words. God is light. And then later, simply, God is love. And Christmas reminds us, and it's a story of God's light and love penetrating our darkness. If we can grasp the story of Christmas and, and take it out of just, you know, the storytelling, storybook, nostalgic sentimentalism and begin to press into the story of Christmas, we begin to realize what a plan God has. That, and when he created us for love, he knew that darkness would come. He knew we would try to fi fill that hole and, and shut out the darkness with all different kinds of things and we would start making love, the pursuit of love, our God, but never realize that, that really it's not love is God. It's God is love. God is love and that's what we need. That's who we need. Christmas reminds us God is love and he came with his light and his love to penetrate our darkness, to shatter the darkness. And if we'll follow Jesus, back to John 8, 12, if we'll follow him, we don't have to walk in darkness. We can have the light of life. But when I use language like God is light, God is love, it's, it's kind of abstract. I said this last week. It's abstract. So God knew that. And uh, God had a plan to try to make that love more real. Maybe you've heard the story. I, I think I've told this before. I don't even know if this story is true because I've heard it for so many t years. But let me tell it. It's the story of a little boy who is scared one night and you know, runs into the bedroom with his mom and dad. And says, hey, can I sleep with you? I'm scared. The mom and dad are like, no, you need to go back to your own bed. <laughs> but I'm scared. It's all right. God will be with you. Kid goes back. That sounds like good theology, he thinks to himself. He climbs back in bed. And the fear starts creeping in again. He's like, ah. So he runs back into the bedroom with mom and dad. Like, no, I don't. I, I'm afraid. Can I sleep with you? No, honey. You need to go back to your bed. This goes on and on and on. And, and, and they keep saying, God's with you. Finally, the kid comes back in, and his theology gets even better. And he says, I need a God with skin on. <laughs> That's good. I need a God I can feel. Because I don't feel him in my own room. He's not there. I need a God who I can touch, who's tangible, who's there. Watch this. Christmas tangibilifies. I, yeah, we all find that in the dictionary, but it's a great word. I, I, I think I, I introduced this word a couple years ago, and I just I love it so much. So make sure you spell it right. God, God's love is tangibilified in Jesus coming as the light of the world. He makes God's love with skin on. Because it's not like God didn't love before Jesus came into the world. He is love. It's just that it was an abstract love. It was a love that we couldn't get our hands around. And so Jesus came to demonstrate God's love. So John says in 1 John 4.16 and also in 4.8, God is love. In fact, turn with me to 1 John because I want to show you something toward the end of your Bibles. If you've gone to the book of Concordance, you've gone too far. 1 John 4, and, and I will put this on the screen for you. 1 John 4 says that God, verse 8, God is love. I just quoted that. God is love. Then he says, verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son to the world. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he sent his only son. So when, when, God, when John says that God is love, he says, he's saying that God's a, a picture of love, the source of love, the, the standard by which love is measured. God is love, but this whole idea of God showing us, God showed his love, is what the tangibilification, ooh, that's just such a great word. The tangibilification of his love is that God showed his love by sending his one and only son, that's Jesus, into the world of people with skin on, God incarnated, which is exactly what that means. God incarnate is God in flesh, incarnate, in flesh. 
God becomes flesh. This is the story of Christmas to show us what love looks like, to demonstrate what love looks like. And so John says it again. This is love. Not that we loved God. Our love is not the measurement of love. But that he loved us and says it again. And sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. If you've ever wondered, is God's love real? Because you, you have or you will. I don't feel God's love. Darkness seems to be encroaching. Remember the cross. Remember that God showed his love. He didn't just write it in the sky. He didn't just say it. It's, he demonstrated it. He showed us his love in sending Christ. This is the story of Christmas. Christmas is God's love embodied. God's love tangibilified. God's love made real that we could touch and see. But we must never talk about God sending his son, Jesus, in such a way that Jesus somehow becomes you know, just you know, the servant of God. God says, I want to show the love to, to the world. And so I'm sending my son. Jesus, you got to go. Really? And so Jesus goes out of obedience to God. No, no, no. Jesus doesn't come to earth just be out of obedience. He comes because he loves. And so Christmas also displays Christ's love. It displays God's love. Yes. It tangibilifies God's love. But it puts on display the fact that Christ also, Jesus Christ, who existed from eternity past as the second person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son has always existed for all eternity. He left heaven. Remember this. Jesus left heaven and came to earth. Why? Because of love. So it's not just God the Father who loves, it's Jesus the Son who displays, Christmas is Jesus' love on display. He comes to earth to, to, to display love. He lives a life of love. This is why we study the life of Jesus. What does love look like? Watch Jesus. When we talk about what does it mean to love God and love people and live surrendered, we ask the question, what does love look like? We look at the life of Jesus, how he treated people, how he spoke to people, how he forgave people. And this is what we've been talking about in the series just, we just finished called Jesus Cares. Jesus demonstrates what love looks like. It's not that on this page we have Jesus loving, or on this page it's, you know, Jesus is just being, you know, something else. No, every word he says is a word of love. Even when that word hurts, every act Jesus does is an act of love, even when people don't understand that. Because Jesus is is incarnating God's love. Everything God does is love, even though we don't always feel it as love, right? Come on. You have all had experiences, maybe this past week, where God did something, or God let something happen, or you felt something, and you went, whoa, where's God? I don't feel his love. This doesn't feel like a loving God. But everything God does, everything God does is love. And everything God allows, he will redeem by his love. Make sure you get this straight. Not everything that happens in the world is something God did. But everything that happens in the world that is painful, that is sinful, God will redeem it. Romans 8, 28, people misquote it all the time. You know, all things work for good for those who love God. No, it's all things work together. Not all things are good. But all things work together for good. Don't misquote it and turn something that's evil into good. Don't misquote it and say, well, everything that's happening is good. No. There's a lot of things that are happening that are darkness, that are sinful, that are painful. But our God redeems that. He works all things together and brings good out of it. God redeems what he allows. You should write that down. God redeems whatever he allows. The last word is that God redeems all because God's love is bigger than our sin, than our errors, than our judgment, than our hurts. God's grace is greater than our sin. His love is greater than anything we could do. God's bigger than us. Yeah, it's, it's true. It doesn't always look like it's true, but God will redeem because God is working 
even in the darkness. That's what was happening on the cross. That darkest place, right? Where the, even the, 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 in the middle of the day, it got dark in Jerusalem around the cross because God was redeeming this sinful world. And darkness surrounded the cross because just like when Jesus was born, his, the, the truth of who he was, it's, it shone brighter against the darkness. When he was born, it was light in the darkness. When he died, though it was very rec rarely recognized, it was light in the darkness. Jesus dies for our sins again because of love, because God redeems what he allows. God is working. He's working right now in your life. You say, I don't see it. I, I understand. I don't see it all the time either. That's what faith is. That's what hope is. I stand in the dark and I say light is coming. I stand in the dark and I say God's redeeming it because faith recognizes that God is light, God is love. I don't have to see that to believe it. I believe that God is redeeming. He's working in the midst of whatever darkness I feel, I am trusting that God is working because he spoke light into the darkness when he created this world. He spoke light in the darkness when he sent his son. And he spoke light in the darkness when his son died on the cross for your sins and mine. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Jesus took upon all of our sins because of his love. So he came to earth because of love. He lived a life of love and he died. Jesus was all about loving, displaying the love of God. This Christmas, the story of Jesus coming is all about his love. And aren't we grateful for his love? Okay, can I have some more of you say yes? Aren't we grateful for his love? Yes. Amen. And we demonstrate that gratitude by how we respond to God's love. Because I could stop right there, and many Christmas sermons do, but God's plan is not yet fully laid out. It's not yet fully completed. I'm about to say something that's going to startle some of you if you're still awake. It's going to startle some of you. God's plan is not yet made complete with Jesus dying on the cross. And you're like, oh, yeah, I know, because he had to rise from the dead. Okay, still not even finished yet with him dying on the cross and being raised from the dead. Well, that's because he had to be ascended to the Father. Yeah, that was the next step. He had to be ascended to the Father. Well, then you mean he it's the coming of the Spirit, right? That's, that's next. But there's more things that have that's come to complete God's plan. God's plan is a big plan. God's plan includes... His love being displayed not only in Christ, but in you. Christmas is one of those times that reveals whether or not we grasp the love of God in Christ. Whether we've taken the Christmas story and just turned it into a nostalgic thing with, with hot cocoa or with, and, you know, and stockings, or whether we've grasped the meaning of Christmas and whether that love has actually been born anew in our heart, whether our hearts have been changed by the love of God, how do we know if it's been changed? By the way we love one another. The same guy, John, that says that God loved us and demonstrated his love by sending Jesus to, a, to die on the cross for us, then says, and brothers, since God has loved us, we ought to love one another. God's love is made complete in us, whoa, 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 this is scripture, this is inspired by God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete. Somehow, there's an incompleteness. If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna take this, at what it says, there's somehow, I can't believe I'm saying this, but there's somehow an incompleteness to God's love when you and I receive God's love and keep it to ourselves. Now, that, that incompleteness is not in God. It's just the story hasn't been played out fully yet. In God, the whole plan is this, you know, yesterday, today, or tomorrow, all the same for God. In his mind, creation has happened. The fall has happened. Christ has come to redeem us, died on the cross, ascended into heaven, you know, raised from the dead, ascended to heaven. Holy Spirit's been sent. The church is coming. And God's, and he's come back, the second coming. It's all together in God's plan. But it hasn't been fully revealed. It hasn't been fully Completed yet. The word complete is the idea of finishing a plan, finishing a race, 
finishing a project. The word is teleos. It means got to its end. In other words, God is saying that my plan, my redemptive plan, that people thought was stymied when sin entered the world, my redemptive plan that was climaxed or highlighted, I mean highlighted at the cross, my redemptive plan includes you loving the people I've placed in your life. Don't miss this. It's not that you just should love. It's that God's plan is completed in you. His love is made complete in you. Do you grasp? Is that crazy or what? Yeah, let me say it for you. That's crazy. God's plan involves you loving. This is what Christmas has come to mean. So we don't just receive the gifts. We give gifts. Somebody got it. We're to celebrate God's love and then give gifts. And this is where things got started, but it's, we've gotten off track. We're to love, not just at Christmas time, but at all times. We're to love one another, the people in our life. And when we do that, God's love is made complete. When we love like Christ. See, this whole idea of becoming like Christ is not just something I made up. It's in the Bible. It's not just a logo or a, a slogan for Church the Open Door, leading people in the adventure of becoming like Christ, loving like Christ. It's a part of God's plan. God's love is made complete when we become more like Christ, when we love like Christ. We're to gift. We're to give presents. We're to Re, actually, you can write this down. We are to represent, to re gift God's love when we give to others. I, I, what I'm trying to do is to help you see the big plan that God has and to see your place in it. It's not just that God so loved the world that He sent His Son for you to be saved. That's awesome, but that's only part of the story. You understand that God so loved the world that He sent His Son to die for you. So that your life would be changed, so the light would shine in the darkness of your light, and you would display that light by loving the people around you. It matters how you love people. It matters how you love people because when you love them poorly, it hurts, it damages, it produces darkness. But when you love them well, when you love them with the love of Christ, God's light shines in the darkness of their lives. This is why we talk about building relationships. It's ways of showing God's love. When we talk about giving Christmas boxes, we're bringing the light and the love of God's love into somebody's life. It's a tangibilification, that Christmas box, of God's love. Angel tree gifts are an, a tangibilification of the love of God. It's not just good deeds. It's demonstrating. So in our words, in our actions, and not just on Christmas, friends, but throughout our, 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 our year, throughout our, our life, we're to show the love of God, to represent again and again and again and again the love of God. This is your part in God's plan. It's, it's amazing to me that he would include us like this. But this is what he's done. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago when I stood up in front of the church and said, um, we've got these, these families in Vermilion that... that uh, where kids are, are coming home from school and not getting anything to eat. And so I said to you, we, we need a hundred of you to, to give some bags filled with some food to give to these families. I, I told you it wouldn't be no problem, but you blew me away. Actually, you didn't because I know what you're like. Um, they, we've got 300 bags of meals of food. Even though we were kind of downplaying it, you know, not everybody do it because we know we're going to do Christmas boxes. 300 bags of, love, of food were given and the people in Vermilion were like, what? What are we going to do? They blew them away. But, but friends, this is who you are. This is who Church the Open Doors. Let me tell you who you are. You are people who live out the love of God, right? That's who you are. So you rose to the challenge and these Christmas boxes, <clears throat> they'll be gone today in all of our videos because this is who you are. You demonstrate the love of God. You love as Christ loved you. Tonight, when we have that Unity Day celebration, you're going to come and you're going to sing and we're going to celebrate the unity we have in Christ because this is who you are, Church of the Open Door. You are here as lights in the world. You are here to display God's love and God bless those of you who are doing it. That's who you are. That's who God sees in you and I'm so proud of you. Let your light so shine that men see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Way to go. This is who we are. 
If you're here going, well, I didn't do that, or you know, I guess I'm not that loving. You have chances every day to love. Seize them. You have chances every day to speak a word of love, to write a note of love, to phone call, to text, to give. There are chances, there are opportunities all around. And when we feel the love, God's grace can cover our sin. God's grace can push back the darkness. But let's not be people who just take advantage of God's grace. Let's be people who bring the light and the love. Let's who, who fulfill what God has done for us in Christ. Amen? Let's continue to live out who he says we are. We are the light of the world. And when we love like Christ, we complete God's love in our world. It's, this should be blowing you away. That's why you're so quiet, because you're like, wow, yeah. And if you're not really sure what I'm talking about, let me go back to point three and remind you that Jesus came to earth for you because he loves you. That Jesus lived a life to demonstrate to you what love looks like. And that Jesus died for you, for your sins. And you can receive his love. You can invite Christ to change your life. Turn from your life of self-centeredness, your ways that seem right to you. This is how I fill up my love deficit. This is how I make myself happy. This is how I, I feel good. No, turn from your self-centered ways and follow the way of Jesus. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, I want to invite you to today to step out of the darkness into the light of God's love and follow Jesus. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Receive his love and let him fill you with his love so you become an instrument of love in this generation, wherever you are. Amen? Because that's when Christmas story gets fully told. Let's pray together. Lord God, we're, we've just discovered we've been telling only part of the Christmas story. It's only part of the Christmas story to talk about Jesus being born. It's only part of the story of Jesus being born and living a life of love. It's only part of the Christmas story of Jesus being born and living a life of love and dying on the cross and being raised from the dead. It's only part of the Christmas story until we began to extend that and to realizing that everyone was made to run on love. And Christians are simply those people who have been filled with the love of God and who now give that love to others. God, make this a Christmas that changes our lives forever and ever. And then when we partake of the bread and the, and the wine at communion, when we eat the bread and drink the cup, we're remembering what love looks like. What love is greater than this, that a person laid down their life for their friends. This is what you did, Jesus. Communion. Celebrating the Eucharist, the, the Lord's Supper is the place where we remember with thanksgiving, where we remember with gratitude in our hearts that you showed us what love looks like. And even today, as we take the bread and drink the cup, we ask you to fill us with your love again. We ask you to refill us so that we can re-present your love to those around us. God, don't let this become an empty ritual. But fill these moments now with your love. For we pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.